Hello and welcome to People's Dispatch. Today we're joined by Vijay Prashad and he's going to talk about his new book, Washington Bullets. The book is published by Leftward Books and it's a, it's a chronicle of the past, it's a chronicle of the present, it's a meditation, it's a path on the future. There's a lot of aspects to his book. Vijay, thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure to be with you, Prashant. Yes, so to begin with, uh, one a very interesting aspect you write about in this book is that it's... Uh, it comes from the literature of light. And now this book is, of course, about a century or even more of how imperialism is functioning. It's about the nuts and bolts of imperialism and its various aspects. And uh, it's my initial thoughts, were like I was telling you, it's a very easy book. It's to read in some senses. It's smooth. It's crystal clear. But it's also, in so some senses, a very difficult book to read because of the scope of the tragedy that imperialism and especially the United States has brought. So to begin with, to ask a more general question before we go into some of the details of the book, how does a meditation or, a, or, or say a reflection of all these incidents of oppression, of torture, of murder, of destruction of people's movements, uh, how do you approach it from the literature of light? Um, it's a very good question. I just want to start by saying that Today is a difficult day for me personally because we lost a great um, African intellectual and leader, Ernest Wamba Dia Wamba, uh, born in 1942. Um, really tremendous intellectual force, Marxist of the most decent uh, caliber and so on. It's a big loss for us. Um, I want to start by saying that several years ago, I, was, I met Ernesto Galeano for the first time. And if you don't know his work, the work of Galliano, um, there's a lot to read, and I recommend him highly to people. Galliano wrote a book about torture in South America, you know, in his home country of Uruguay, but also Chile, Argentina, Brazil, and so on. And the book is really quite an amazing uh, account, day and light. It's an amazing account of something hideous. So I asked him, I said, you know, uh, how is it, Galeano, that you are able to write a book about torture uh, in this way? And his answer stayed with me uh, ever since. He said that, you see, um, a torturer takes a human body and puts it through terrible pain to try to extract either confession or just to punish the body. And he said... When a writer writes about something like that, they should not reproduce the torture. The writer should be able to capture the human being who's being terrorized. What is in their mind? You know, in other words, you must write about torture. But the text that writes on torture from a left standpoint must tell the story from the standpoint of human resilience. The very fact that the human being who's being tortured that person must be the subject of the story, not the torturer. And I think too often books about imperialism, books about war, tell the story from the standpoint of, you know, the aggressor. And we should really try to find another way. So I wanted to tell the story of essentially U.S. imperialism, not necessarily from the standpoint of the victim, because I wanted to document what U.S. imperialism is like. But it must have the sensibility of the strugglers, the fighters, the survivors. I mean, human resilience has to set the terms for the pros. And this is a lesson, again, that I don't claim originality here. I learned this lesson from Galliano, who I think, you know, really charted a path for how to write about the hideous side of history, but keeping the luminous side, the side of light, uh, in focus. Right, absolutely. And quickly to go through the book, there are three components, three parts uh, in the book. The first, in some senses, is a overarching view of, say, like I said, maybe a century or more. And it's also an institutional look into imperialism itself, the kind of global context over the past 50 to 100 years. What are the kind of institutions that were built up? What were the moments of hope when resistance resistance flared up and it looked like there would be a change. So that's the first part. And a very interesting thing you write about is that the whole I the idea that the last 50 or 60 years was about the Cold War between the communist USSR-led bloc and the 
capitalist U.S. bloc. Of course, there's an element of truth to it, but it is also about imperialism and led by the U.S. versus the global south. So could you talk a bit about that aspect? You see, um, the great process that we have before us for the past hundred years is the process of decolonization. That is the really the, the triumphant process of the human spirit for the past hundred years. A people who had been under the yoke of colonialisms of one kind or the other have fought very hard to break free of that yoke. And you know this, of course, is manifest in um, the Americas in the fights led by Simon Bolivar um, in the early 19th century. This is manifest um, in the plantations of Haiti, where the you know essentially plantation proletariat, uh, the people who ha- whose bodies whose whose lives had been commodified, you know, they had become um, you know uh, articles of commerce, what are otherwise known as slaves. Uh, the Great Rebellion of Haiti is an act of decolonization. If you go all the way from Haiti to the contemporary struggles of the Palestinian people, this is, Prashant, one long arc of struggle. From Haiti to Palestine is an un, you know, unfinished process. In fact, the United Nations General Assembly passed a resolution in 1961, which I really love. I love one sentence of the resolution. It says the process of liberation is irresistible. You know, it's such a poetic phrase coming from a UN resolution. The process of liberation is irresistible. But of course, it has been resisted. And it was resisted essentially from the imperialist bloc. Initially, of course, the old European colonial empires from Great Britain to Portugal and Spain. You know, the the arc of anti um, uh, the anti-decolonization process or the, the, the kind of maintenance of colonialism runs from the early uh, rebellions, you know, including Haiti, all the way out to the 1960s, because people forget, and 70s, people forget the Portuguese fought tooth and nail to maintain the empire until 1974. The British fought military campaigns in Malaya, in Kenya, after World War II. The Dutch fought in Indochina, I mean, in in Indonesia. And the French and the Americans fought against Indochina, later Vietnam, you know, to prevent decolonization. It's interesting, the Soviet Union was, in my opinion, or the Russian Revolution, was a part of the decolonization process. Because after all, Lenin theorized the revolution as a revolution of national liberation as much as anything. You know, that is why they had self-determination for the minorities. That is why it was called the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, including the republics in Central Asia and so on. So, I mean, this idea of the great process of the 20th and into the 21st century is the battle between decolonization, the right of people, to command their own lives. You know, this comes right down to today, Venezuela. The Venezuelan people want to command their own resources. They would like to use the oil the way they would like to, not the way multinational corporations would like to. And so that, to my mind, if I was to take this long arc, what the defining feature of this long arc is not the Cold War, the post-Cold War era, the this, the that. It's a long battle between the forces of colonialism and the forces of decolonization. Absolutely. And uh, to sort of look at the first chapter, the first part in a bit of a brief, interesting point you mentioned is that if you stood at 1979 and looked back, there uh, there was an amazing potential. There was a spirit of revolution in the air. Like you said, most of the decolonization process had been completed. There were, of course, setbacks, but there were also what what really marks the shift. As in, what were the processes that led to that shift? It is interesting. I mean, the place to have stood, Prashant, in 1979 is at a high peak of the Hindu Kush mountains. That would have been a really interesting place to observe everything because you would have seen. You know, the revolutionary process in Iran, which in 78, 79 could have gone anywhere. It need not have gone in a theocratic religious direction. It could have been a communist revolution. In Afghanistan, there was in 1978, August, the Saur revolution in Afghanistan. 
in pakistan there was a military coup in 77 but the struggles against that coup were quite fierce you know in baluchistan there was armed struggle and so on in india the emergency was thrown out in 1977 i mean if you stood at the hindu kush and looked at this area of great population uh, it could have gone anywhere you know the direction and this is why the us intervention into afghanistan is so significant it's not just about afghanistan or later the creation of al qaeda or anything it's how the united states used pakistan as a in a sense lily pad to crush uh, what was happening in afghanistan uh, to really take out uh, the possibility of a left uh, resurgence in that part of the world if you go out then to central america another place of great potential you know uh, the sandinistas had taken power they'd come into managua and then the carter administration mines the harbor of managua you know the, the viciousness of the us intervention again using honduras as a lily pad you know pakistan here honduras there in, in the central part of africa uh, you know the immense pressure against ethiopia you know anywhere in sudan you know immense pressure against the left and so on um, the united states from the late 70s this is the carter administration mind you this is not yet reagan the carter administration and then reagan even more used immense military force alliances with the worst kind of oligarchic militaries arms sales and so on to crush the left in in this belt this tropical belt at the same time by lifting up us interest rates you know the volcker shock in 1979 uh, the debt crisis is triggered in the third world so combination of massive military force with the debt crisis really crushes the aspirations which were at a very high point in 73 74 when in algiers the countries of the world came together and they said we're going to have a new international economic order i mean an extraordinary idea it was crushed by military force and the debt crisis and the consequences of what happened then are with us today and to sort of move on to the second part of course we'll come back to some of these aspects later so the second part is a manual of regime change so to speak it's a it's an interesting read in some senses because although the stories are from 30 or 40 years ago there's of course the story of guatemala from the 50s there's chile there's indonesia but we see it actually happening almost every day right now when it comes to bolivia when it comes to venezuela when it comes to so many other in the countries so in some senses there is an essential continuity of these regime change processes these imperialist processes but could you talk also a bit about how the idea of hybrid war is also evolved a bit in these times yeah you see the second part of these nine chapters so called for regime change it's like you as you said this i call it a manual because these are um really important integral parts of how governments are overthrown you know how they should be delegitimized how the military needs to be brought to your side how propaganda must function and none of these coups happened without so called mass support you know what later gets called color revolutions these go back you know 70 80 years this this kind of technique is well established the idea of hybrid war uh, takes on i think a sharp um you know uh, form during the period when everything is digital you know when information is digital banking is digital and so on but the very notion of hybrid war is an ancient notion in other words uh, from early battles you would conduct information warfare to delegitimize the enemy and so on you would conduct sabotage economic warfare you know you try to sanction a place you, this goes back to the old greek epics you know you'd put your ships and you'd blockade a, a city you know what was a right. medieval siege right. we even used the term sanctions against iraq was a medieval siege it's true that was a medieval siege so these ideas of warfare are old but when you put these techniques with the kind of technological sophistication today you know whereby uh, hacking into a computer system you can destroy the electricity grid of a country um you know it, it the technological advances have made it much easier to do hybrid war in other words you can attack a country without bombing it and you can attack it fatally um you can cut it off from international financial systems that's a fatal attack at a country you can prevent it from uh, you know accessing commercial aircraft 
uh, you know, Venezuela wants to buy at market price oil from Iran, you can prevent it. And then it's a big act of politics for the Iranians to send five tankers to Venezuela. That was a mere commercial transaction, you know, by the law of capitalism. It wasn't free oil, um, and yet it can be blocked. So hybrid war today is the very sophisticated set of instruments generally used by the United States government to destabilize a country as they're attempting to do with Venezuela, destabilize the government, delegitimize it, have it diplomatically sanctioned, cut it off from financial markets and so on, and do it without dropping a bomb. Um, and therefore you can say, we're not doing anything. We're not actually at war with you. We're just following you know, international law. But this law has been weaponized and corrupted. And I think that's the nature of 21st century hybrid war. It's very old techniques. But because of technological advancement, uh, they have a much sharper and much deadlier um, you know, effect, much more than, in fact, aerial bombardment. What the U.S. can do to Venezuela today by hybrid war techniques is actually much more threatening than aerial bombardment because aerial bombardment, the world can see and they can condemn. They're not condemning the kind of techniques used by the U.S. and the impact is nonetheless very much like a complete full-scale bombardment. Absolutely. And a key aspect you mentioned in both these parts is, of course, the role of international institutions. So, of course, we have the most classic example being the Organization of American States, whose role has been very thoroughly exposed and you have focused quite a bit on it. But there's also, of course, NATO, the Seattle Pacific Alliance, and we see examples today also. So the interesting thing, of course, was that there were alternatives that did emerge against many of these options. There was an online movement. You mentioned the the new international economic order. There was, of course, Tricontinental, which was to the uh, most to the left and which actually exerted pressure on the non-aligned movement. So could you talk a bit about how uh, these worked against each other and what maybe led to some of the, uh, the resistance groups, so to speak, being unable to sort of maintain it? Well, you know, imperialist countries from before the United States becoming the main imperialist force in the world have always attempted to speak in a universal voice. You know, the British said that they are in India, not for British interests, but to help Indians and help humanity, you know, to civilize the civilizing mission. That's a French term. Uh, French were always on a civilizing mission. They were not there for French, parochial French gains. Imperialists always claim universal um, you know, uh, a, a universal understanding of their project. And I think it's a part of the work of, um, of our work to parochialize their claim, you know, saying, no, no, wait a minute. United States is not in Bolivia for human rights, which is a universalizing claim. You're there for the lithium. You're there for the indium. Let's face it, guys. You know, let's be frank. OK, you are not out there to promote human rights. That's the parochializing of the universal aspect. When the non-aligned movement was created in 61 and tricontinental in 66, that was part of the agenda to say that, listen, you can't define reality. We want to also define reality. We have our own ideas. We want to put them on the table. We are not just recipients of your universal judgment. I think that's a very important part of the NAM. The NAM still exists. The non-aligned movement still exists. It still meets, but it's much weaker. And its weakness comes from the reality that many of its constituent member states damaged by the debt crisis um, with new class configurations in power in their countries, like India is a good example, a uh, real leader, founder of the non-aligned movement. Now, you know, it's a follower of the United States. In fact, the Indian government is a bhakt of the United States. It's a, it's a devotee of the United States government. It doesn't have an independent attitude to world affairs. And so it accepts the U.S. narrative on China, for instance, as a universal story, not as a parochial American story about trade wars, because the United States terrified that the Chinese will have a technological advantage over two or three generations. You know, that's a reasonable understanding of why the U.S. is in a trade war. But the Indian government will say, no, no, they have a universal understanding. So that was the fight. NAM was created to create independent institutions that reflect the independent assessment of world affairs by these newly emergent decolonized states. And right. that was simply not allowed to exist. So their independence had to be destroyed. Right. And the other key aspect, of course, you may look at in this manual is how definitions are so important. 
So a protest in favor, uh, what you call supporting Maduro is seen as say, stage managed, whereas a protest or a couple of people gathering in gathering around Guaido becomes an expression of the free will of the Venezuelans. So there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of definitions that come into play there, including the question of freedom itself. But one key aspect, of course, has been the role of the media, and you didn't quite extensively about it, starting from 1954 in Guatemala, when some of the most significant media organizations of the time went there and rubber stamped the US version to say the Iraq war and weapons of mass destruction. So uh, in, these cont- in, the, in these times also, how do you see the media functioning and continuing to function in this way? You see, Prashant, it's quite shameful that uh, we have on record that the head of the director of the CIA calls the New York Times and says, I don't like that reporter, get him out of there, send this person, and they do it. I mean, we have it on record in the CIA documents that major news organizations that exist today, that exist today, were basically taking orders from the CIA about how to cover something in Guatemala, Australian newspapers, how to cover matters in Indonesia, and so on. We, We have this on record. And these papers, A, have not apologized for that publicly. You know, they make a big deal of the fact that, you know, they are guardians of the truth, all the news fit to print. They haven't apologized for that. And it's very clear that today their reporters, I don't know if they're getting calls from the CIA. Maybe they are. We don't know that. But it's very clear that they have they persist with this. Um, you know, the sense that they are spokespersons for the U.S. State Department. It's very clear. I mean, on Venezuela, the New York Times, for instance, is indistinguishable from the U.S. State Department reporting. You know, uh, we did a story which was published at People's Dispatch on the claim made by William Barr that the leadership in Venezuela, including President Nicolas Maduro, are drug traffickers. And it, it's stunning that the New York Times and others just reproduced Barr's press release and what he said in the press conference. They didn't ask a simple question. The Drug Enforcement Agency of the United States government, its own current reports say that more than 90% of cocaine comes from Colombia. Yet Barr says it's coming from Venezuela. The New York Times doesn't even raise this contradiction in its reporting. That to me demonstrates this is a spokesperson for the State Department, it's not an independent media out- outfit. And the same with Bolivia also, where now, of course, every day they're printing reports saying that, yes, there was probably no electoral fraud, but at that point of time, they were in the forefront of peddling some of these theories. It's scandalous. I mean, this is a, the Bolivia story is a scandal, and I'm extraordinarily proud that President Evo Morales Aima wrote the preface to Washington Bullets. It makes me very proud because he was, in a sense, the last person who faced the wrath in our time of Washington bullets. I mean, he was the victim of an illegal U.S.-backed coup, uh, which the New York Times, the Washington Post, and several Western so-called left media outlets totally supported this coup against uh, Evo Morales. At the time, when we were all writing, saying this is a coup, they said, no, no, it's democracy and so on. Yes, this is exactly what happens. These governments do a coup, the media supports the coup, and then later to burnish their credentials, to brush off the stain of having supported a coup. They say, well, you know, now, but now it's too late. Mr. Morales is in exile in Argentina. The current government is essentially destroying any democratic process. It's going after militants of the movement to socialism. Nobody is reporting that. I mean, if the New York Times was a genuine media outlet, it would say, yes, it was actually a wrong in November of 2019. It was not uh, electoral fraud. And by the way, now we're going to report earnestly about the human rights violations from the government, so-called government of Jeanette Anes. They're not doing that. And because they're not doing that, their so-called apology for the reporting in November is to me worthless. It's, It's not worth the New York Times in which it's printed. Absolutely. And uh, two other key aspects also. One, of course, you mentioned, say, some sections of the left. And in this context, there's a small section you dedicate to conspiracy theories about the idea of how talking about imperialism, in some senses, equated to being a conspiracy theorist. 
Whereas, you know, talking about, uh, say, talk, talking about leaders from afar or talking about countries where, which are charting a different path, you know, you're seen as somebody who is just being uh, strange. So could you elaborate a bit on that aspect also? Because I think it's very essential in today's debate. It's, it's very interesting. I mean, the, the CIA and the U.S. State Department spent many, many reports going over how best to influence public opinion. I, I was very interested in this, you know, how to delegitimize the left, essentially. And one way to delegitimize the left is to treat them as nutcases, you know, as conspiracy theorists, tinfoil wearing people, to equate people who believe, for instance, that aliens have come to Earth and have captured a government with somebody who talks government uh, forming a conspiracy to overthrow the government in Guatemala. You see, Guatemala is very interesting, Prashant. That's why I spend a lot of time there, because we have documentary evidence of the United States government with for no reason other than the fact that the Guatemalan government of Jacob Arbenz was expropriating some lands of United Fruit. It's very important. He was not throwing United Fruit out of, out of Guatemala. He was expropri expropriating some land from United Fruit. In Washington, the people at the CIA and so on, they had actually a pecuniary interest in, Washington, in United Fruit. They, they were either board members or they had shares and so on. They had a very parochial interest in what was going on. Okay, that's fine. But here's what it is, is we have all the evidence of a conspiracy constructed in Washington, D.C. to overthrow the government in Guatemala. We have evidence of a conspiracy to overthrow the government in Iran in 1953. We have a conspiracy to overthrow the government in Chile from 1970 to 73. The elements of the conspiracy are there. It is not possible to say that did not happen. Now, if I say there is a conspiracy to overthrow the government of Venezuela, which there is, because unlike in 1953-54, they are saying it in plain daylight. They are saying we are conspiring through the Lima group, through this organ, to overthrow the government of Nicolas Maduro. They are saying it. It is a conspiracy of them. By me reporting their conspiracy doesn't make me a conspiracy theorist. It makes me a journalist. It's their conspiracy. It's not my co concocted thing in my head, but a liberal journalist at the New York Times is like, come on, guys, there's all kinds of interest. No, there isn't actually. Actually, what William Barr did when he came out there and said that there is a narco trafficking cell in the Venezuelan government, total nonsensical uh, indictment that the U.S. government brought. Genuine reporters around the world should have said these are a, it's a crazy conspiracy. These people are not credible. Instead, they report that as if it's real. And they say that then somebody like myself, I am a conspiracy theorist. I have made up no conspiracy. They are conspiring in broad daylight. I'm merely reporting on the conspiracy. The idea of conspiracy theory is very clever. It delegitimizes people who criticize power. Exactly. Absolutely. And in this context, uh, since you mentioned Barr as well, uh, I'll talk a bit about the United States also, because there's a very interesting line you mentioned, you mentioned where you say that US imperialism was not born in the harbors of Havana or Manila, but within what is now called the United States itself, that it was what from the very beginning, the earliest settlers, the so-called uh, the, the founding fathers, what they were involved in was imperialism itself. But a question at this point of time when we're looking at it today, of course, also is that in this age of Trump, in this age of a declining uh, United States in terms of economic power, at least, how, do, how, how are some of these strategies still continuing to work? Of course, we know examples like Venezuela and Bolivia, but uh, how do, say, some of these more structural aspects continue to work? Well, firstly, the United States government military has not declined at all. Its exactly. ability to bomb any country, its you know, global basing is very significant. And the U.S. has always created a hub and spokes uh, methodology, you know, where it is the hub uh, of this imperial geography and it creates spokes, you know, Japan, um, South Korea, um, you know, uh, Colombia and so on. India, and these are the spokes to exert its power territorially. It also has bases and so on. But importantly, in many countries around the world, small oligarchies that have power 
are feeling extraordinarily vulnerable as more and more people are not only you know being thrown out of permanent employment and therefore permanently unemployed but they are deeply dissatisfied with the state of the world and you've seen protests and demonstrations and rioting take place globally the united states comes in as the protector of oligarchies and that is how it maintains its power i mean whether it's an oligarchy in the democratic republic of the congo or it's an oligarchy you know in in um, in colombia you know the government of ivan duque i mean it's a oligarchs government you know let's be clear this is not a government of the people it's an oligarchs government um you know the government in egypt i mean the government led by abdul fatah el sisi is an oligarchs government the united states government ultimately at least the is the is the backer the underwriter of these oligarchs governments and as long as the class basis of these oligarchs is there they will welcome us um, you know intervention and help uh, they will welcome arms sales they will welcome training military training they will welcome joint exercises i mean the very fact uh, prashant along the sahel region of africa that french special forces are operating in niger in mali etc with the consent of those governments tells you a lot about the structure of imperialism it's not that the us needs to unilaterally come and bomb somewhere they work with these oligarchies see the united the french government is not working with the people of mali it's working with an oligarchic government um, you know it's it's not a popular project that they have to construct they just need to work with the oligarchies you know in niger same thing and i think that's what one needs to look at it's very befuddling because you say oh mali invited them in well, what is mali exactly and we say finally to conclude uh, two aspects really stand out when we read the book in uh, in totality one of course is the machine of imperialism so to speak this very bloody the bloody gears the tools that are involved which almost seems to march with some kind of precision on the other hand what is uh inspiring for some people maybe surprising but maybe even natural is the fact that it has never really managed to stop resistance and resistance is fresh waves have come up again and again even in countries where you know the boot of imperialism was severely press fresh waves of imperialism have come in and in this context it's very interesting of course that you uh, when one of you in the, the part 2 for instance ends with thomas sankara saying that we must dare to invent the future which is an amazing line and in some senses sums up i think also what you were trying to write so in this context at this point of time we have the pandemic and we have some so many process happening how do you see or where do you see this future being invented who are the people who are daring i just want to say three quick things three little images i'll leave you with uh, prashant one is in the uh, naval uh, office school in the naval school in buenos aires argentina in the basement where the tortures took place during the time of the junta there is a photo exhibit there uh, one of the prisoners was a photographer and he was asked to photograph every body who came in to be tortured killed and thrown some of them live from helicopters into the atlantic ocean is a time of great tragedy there is a picture that struck me it's a woman young woman who's brought in and there's two photographs of her the look she gives the camera is a look of such immense defiance that it stopped me and i felt you are such a courageous person i don't know your name but your courage is incredible and i i want to celebrate the fact of human resilience you know she knew she was going to be tortured she knew that she was going to be killed but she was not going to give that camera um you know the opportunity to pity her or to uh, to be powerful over her she looked straight into the lens and she looked at it with such great defiance that i i i want to just say that the possibilities of human resilience are epic and we should actually hold fast to that secondly thomas sankara was murdered in 1987 he was a great leader of the country of burkina faso um a man beloved by my generation of of people i mean i well re- well remember the day on may 5th 1987 when he was killed uh, you know it's not something you forget easily he was a very great man just a few days ago in the middle of the pandemic um in the building across from where he was killed in uagadugu the capital of burkina faso a massive statue was erected of our commandant uh, thomas sankara massive statue you know you you kill him in 1987 but in 2020 we will erect statues to him it's not to him 
that the statue is elected. It's to the possibility of daring that we'll build a future. That's the second image I want to have us. The third is in the middle of this pandemic, when country after country in the capitalist world is falling apart, you know, we see a country like Laos, and I just did a story for, you know, which was in People's Dispatch on Laos. Laos, a country of 7 million people with a socialist government, landlocked country, borders China, not one death confirmed by the Red Cross and Red Crescent Society, not one debt. How, how were they able to do this? Because it was a government and a people that treated their own public with compassion. There are people's movements, trade unions, women's organizations, peasant or around the world that understand that our movement is not about efficiency. Our movement is about humanity and compassion. If you don't create structures that treat people with humanity and compassion, you will fail them. You don't, we don't want efficient organizations. Efficient organizations cut the fat and then they just don't care about people. The principal way in which we want to organize society is compassion. And I think that's a lesson related to human resilience. You know, and by the way, somebody rolling their eyes as I'm saying that, saying this guy is a utopian nutcase. Thanks for that, because I am a utopian nutcase. And Utopia is in our movements. It's alive. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Vijay, for talking to us. It is a pleasure. Thanks a lot. That's all we have time for today. You can buy the book from the Leftward uh, book site. Keep watching People's Dispatch.